Well, good morning, family. How are you? Oh, man, it's kind of nice to be together, isn't it, like this? This is great. Uh, We are excited that you're here. Some are more excited than others, but okay. (laughs) Oh, man, and it is good to be the family of God. In fact, that's what we're going to be continuing talking about this morning is our series on what it actually means to be a spiritual family. And and as always, it's always good to do family business and talk about family things. And uh, it's good to be together like this again on a Sunday morning, but also, you know, it, we do have a brand new nursery for zero to three years old. If if anyone has, it's been redone, uh, you know, so case, yeah, there you go. And, but I also want to let you know that there is a nest for nursing mothers that has been completely remodeled. It's just right down this hall to the left. So if that fits the place that you're at in life, we have live streamed uh, the worship in there for you as well. So uh, if you'd like to take advantage of that, those are there available to you. And I tell you what, man, I I felt like I opened Pandora's box last week as I started talking about anniversaries because I was on social media this week and I just kept seeing, man, some of y'all have been married a long time. And um, I mean, I'm sure that's just because you're wise, you know, but uh, but the McGraws this week celebrated 45 years of marriage. Uh, Go ahead. That's a great thing. The Currington's celebrated 58 is that correct this week that's awesome miss rita and the shalas okay they won 60 where are y'all at 60 years this week again a mentor of mine said you celebrate that which we want to multiply and uh, we celebrate you guys and uh, we're so thankful for you showing a picture of the kingdom to us in that way and again next week We might be out of our minds, but we're inviting all the kids and their families to our house uh, next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. We've rented some water slides, so bathing suits, water shoes might not be a bad idea, towels. uh, Bring your chairs, because we're going to sit around and just fellowship till about 2 o'clock. Come and go if you'd like, uh, but we're available. Uh, If you could call the office and let us know you're coming, because we are cooking hot dogs and we need to plan a little bit, but uh, come anyway. Uh, We would love for you guys to be a part and, and, uh, and let us host you and celebrate your family next Saturday. So again, I talked about continuing a series on what it means to be the family of God. And, and I'm telling you what, family is the structure in which God has chosen to build the kingdom on this earth. It is the vessel he is filling with all the culture of heaven on earth. And I'm telling you what, it begins and ends with the family both your biological family and today what we're experiencing here today, our spiritual family. And again, and I've said it every week, I I don't understand. I've always had a spiritual family. I've never known life without having both a, a really good biological family, but also a really good church and different spiritual families that I belonged to along the way. And I just don't understand, honestly, how people do the ebb and flow of life without family. I don't get it. I don't understand. I mean, it's, it's, and it's not only the lows. I mean, we're going to see a testimony here in a minute of, of a family that went through a low and, and, and the lowest of lows that a person can experience and how family meant so much to them. But you know, it's also the highs. What, what happens when there's no one there to celebrate you? I mean, not to be jealous of you for whatever's going good in your life, but can actually come around you and go, man, I'm excited. That's incredible. Family's everything. But I understand for, 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 for many who are in this room, family has been so distorted. It's been so messed up in our lives because of just weakness and, and failure and sin. And, and, you know, people have actually given me counsel, and I've read different people who said, hey, we need to lose the family language in church because because we've messed it up so bad through everything that's happened, through everything that's going on in culture now. So you should use words like church and and gatherings and things like that because, because when you start using familial language, it has such a negative connotation to so many people. And by the way, I, I get that. And I understand whatever family pain you have, we're not going to brush over that. We're not going to ignore that. But neither are we going to ignore 
the picture that God creates from Genesis to Revelation of the family of God. We cannot abandon and, and as many times as, as we're called the church and, and the kingdom, I want you to know, woven throughout the narrative of Scripture is familial language of fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. And by the way, the aching in your heart that might be damaged because of family wounds, the word church just doesn't fill that void, does it? And as cool as that word is, he won't do it for you. You need family. Not a perfect family. But you need family. You need to be a part of something for people who are growing closer to God and growing closer together and messing up and stumbling along the way but permeating everything with the grace of Jesus Christ. Nothing will feel what you're missing in your life like family. We can't abandon it. We keep, have to keep the standard here and keep shooting for the goal because that is the cry of the people's hearts and it's because God put it there. The testimony that we're going to see this morning is of a matriarch and patriarch among us, James and Rita Carrington. Now, Rita wanted me to let y'all know that right after this, we, they rushed James to the hospital because he had pneumonia. And James a little, is a little quiet in the video. And you know if James is quiet, he's sick. If you know James Carrington, so, so know that. But uh, we interviewed them and, and we talked about family and we talked about life. I want you to listen to their journey of their life and how both biological and spiritual family has meant everything to them in the highs and in the lows. Let's watch this video. Rita Currington, and uh, we've been at Eastern Hills and going back to Robbins Road, uh, probably close to 45 years. Yeah. Um, we, we lived in Malakoff and we had so many friends, wonderful Christian friends and at Eastern Hills at, or Robbins Road that we, we came over and then James went to work in Athens. So we've been yeah. here a long time and we have lots and lots of wonderful memories yes, we uh, do. of Eastern Hills. I always think back to how we were one of five couples who did everything together. We sucked the kids off somewhere and we went somewhere and we had uh, one time we had communion out on a mountain in Arkansas wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh it blew. But anyway, we were all one. Had three of the best kids. It, it wasn't hard to, to raise our children. We had a lot of help. Yep. And uh, so many good examples. And, and I did most of it. I, I, and I think our kids are, are extraordinary. They are. And lo and behold, our son Trey had a little freckle on the back of his eye and the ophthalmologist determined that it was melanoma. And so they did radiation and it metastasized and just went all over his body. And he fought yeah. and we prayed and yeah. everybody in Texas and states around was praying for him. Yes. And. Uh, and God didn't answer the prayer we prayed. I mean, Trey's well now. We prayed for him to be well. Praise God. And uh, he is well now. Some of Trey's friends told us, even at his graveside service, that they were going to be better because of him, that he, they, they were determined to live a better life because of the life he lived. And so, you know, that's, that's a blessing. I'll tell you one thing, communion lessons have a whole new meaning for me because, you know, God knows what it's like to lose a son. That's right. And so I, I think about that. I don't ever doubt that no. it's there. Um, never I have never doubted it felt like God had deserted us when no. all the things we've 
been through. I just felt like that he was there to go with us and uh, get us through it. See us through. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. Every time he did. It's the joy of my salvation. It's the joy of our children. Oh my goodness, we love them. We have 10 grandchildren and three great granddaughters. You know, we see in movies and things uh, how they always talk about people fussing and fighting at Christmas and holidays. Yeah. And I, I just don't understand that. I, mm -hmm. I can't identify with that because we have fun, uh, we play games, we exchange gifts. We just, it, it's just always a joyful time when we're together. Nothing better than being with family. No. That's right. Mm. Thank you, Carringtons. <laughs> what just captured me this morning, I've watched this a lot, obviously, is just at the end, you know, through pneumonia. <laughs> Literally, James is there about to be hospitalized by, by pneumonia, and you know his health crisis. And he proclaims the joy of his salvation. Can't fake that. So the question is, what's the key? What's the answer? The worst thing psychologists and just common sense can tell you that you can endure through this life is the loss of a child. I don't care whatever age they are. It's the worst pain known to man. And for this family to give the testimony that they did... I want to know the treasure. I want to know the key. And I believe it's a testament of their faith, obviously, their relationship with God. But as they said throughout the video, it's also the testament of family, both biological and their spiritual family. Do you realize the gift you have in each other? Do you realize the incredible favor that you have just because you share Jesus with the people in this room. So the worst thing that life could throw out at you is not that it's easy and not that the pain necessarily ever goes away in some form or fashion, but in the end, God can still be glorified. He can still be lifted up. I want to be a part of that. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of that level of authenticity. I'll give my life to be a part of that. That is the family of God. This morning we'll be in Hebrews chapter 10 briefly. And so if you're turning there in your devices or your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, I want to give you the context of Hebrews because that's just what I do because I like it because I'm a Bible nerd. And uh, so the context of Hebrews is, is, is imagine a, a pastor or a pastor preacher who, who wrote a sermon to a group of people that he loved dearly. And this isn't just a normal letter like that Paul would write. This is someone who, who actually preached and pastored and, 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 and walked beside a group of people. And basically Hebrews is kind of, a, kind of the written word-by-word -word manuscript of, of a sermon of a pastor who dearly loved this group of people. They were a group of people probably in a Hellenistic or a Greek context who had adopted Judaism in, in some form or fashion. And, and there's something you need to know about the Hellenistic and Greek influence uh, around the first century was, man, being social was everything. Your social status and, and your place within society determined everything for you. It determined not only uh, uh, the privileges that you would get to go to, the parties that you would get to go to that meant so much, but it also affected your business, your economy, and how you would buy and sell and trade. Society was everything, and your place within it meant the level of your existence and the level, honestly, within that culture of your survival. 
and this pastor's writing to a church and to a group of people or to a region in which they are being marginalized in society. And it's happening in two ways. Number one, it's happening just from the, the Greek society and the Greek of philosophy and everything that's going on. See, it's not becoming cool anymore to be a Christian. Oh, it, it was kind of neat when it first came in because they treated it just like some other philosophy or some other teaching that was coming. Oh, but this Christianity thing was different. It was actually changing culture, and they couldn't have that. And so now Christianity is being pushed out, and it's not good. In fact, if you're a Christian, your society and your place in society begins to be diminished. And for people who lived in that culture, that was a very difficult situation. But also, their religious position was being marginalized. You see, because these particular people had embraced Judaism. And they, even though they were probably Greeks, they had, had adopted the lifestyle and the feast and, and everything that went along. And, and uh, they got to participate in synagogue to a degree. And they had completely em enmeshed themselves into Jewish culture. And now that they were Christians, it was hard to be a Christian Jew back then. You have to understand most of the New Testament talks about this. So not only they were being marginalized within their society, they were being mar marginalized in their religion. And it wasn't good anymore. It wasn't to be a Christian and so here are these Christians who are caught between these two worlds. They no longer fit in over here, and they no longer fit in over here, and their faith is beginning to waver because they have no place. And this is what the pastor, this is what the preacher is speaking into when he says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let's bring that up. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up the meeting together as some in their habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. May God bless the reading of his word. You see, the preacher was concerned that the people were stuck. They didn't know which way to go. They didn't know where they belonged. And even though the, the physical persecution hadn't come yet, this emotional and not fitting in and all of those themes are flooding them and they're struggling. And some quit growing. Some quit coming to church. And they were just stuck in this no man's land. So what do we do? You ever feeling stuck? You ever feel stuck between what's going on out there and then what you know to be true from the Bible about the kingdom of God and about the family of God? Just to be honest, have you ever fit in better out there than in here? And you struggle with that. You feel like your place out there seems more secure sometimes than your place in here. You're in good company for the recipients of this sermon. The very first thing that the preacher says is to spur one another on. Now, this word spur, what's the first thing that comes in your mind? When you just, if, if I were to just take it out of context and I just said the word spur, what would you think? You'd think cowboy, wouldn't you? That's exactly what it means. It also can be translated provoke. Okay, are you getting the picture? This isn't a gentle conversation. This isn't um, a conversation where, where you're dancing around the truth. No, this is a conversation that you're having with a brother or a sister in Christ that's what? Stuck. And you are spurring them. You are provoking them toward love and good deeds. Why? Because they're worth it even to have that hard conversation. It's like this. I kind of, kind of what is it like? You know, I grew up doing athletics, and, and it's, it's kind of like those coaches that yelled at you, but you actually believed that they believed in you. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I just 
kind of think we need more coaches to yell at kids. That's my honest opinion. Maybe it'll desensitize us a little bit and, you know, make us not so, okay, I'll leave that alone. All right, so, but, but the coach, you know, you know what fires up a coach? For an athlete to reach their potential. For their athlete to give 100% to leave it all out on the field or all out on the court and to give 100% and to reach their potential wherever that is. Now, of course, coaches want to win. They'd be lying to you if they didn't say that. But their greatest heart and their greatest passion is for every one of their athletes on the field and on the bench to reach their potential. And there's nothing more frustrating to a coach to see subpar, to see someone not reaching their potential because they won't give 100%. And so when that coach is, is, is crawling down the throat of your kid, it might be because they love them and they want them to reach their potential. And they're doing it like spurring or provoking them because if they could just provoke them enough, maybe they'll take that energy out onto the field and give what they're capable of giving. I think this is what the Hebrew writer is saying. And somehow we've lost that in the family of God. And let's just put the family of God over here. We've lost that in our families. The willingness to provoke. You see, we say that we're stuck, but yet remember in the kingdom of God, I preached about this a couple of months, months ago. The kingdom of God is not static. It's always dynamic, which means it can't stand still. It's either moving ahead or moving behind all the time. So if a Christian is stuck, they're moving toward immaturity, not maturity, not growth, not the kingdom. And that should frustrate us like a coach. When we see each other not reaching our potential, when we see each other getting caught in our own head and not giving 100%, it should fire us up just as much as that coach loved his athlete to go, uh-uh, no, not acceptable. I love you. You get back on the path. You put your eyes on Jesus, and I am not going to leave your side till you're walking toward him again. Do you love each other enough to have conflict, to confront you see, and what we're moving or provoking each other towards sometimes is this love, this love of Christ. It is agape here that manifests itself in good deeds. It is the command of the New Testament, love like Jesus loves. And it's always the standard. And we don't have to be perfect in that, but we always have to be moving toward that. And when a brother stuck between two worlds or a sister stuck between two worlds in love, get out the spur and go to them. And let me risk conflict. Risk conflict. You see, in Hebrews chapter 13, it actually gives two reasons, two places specifically of when we need to go and spur and provoke. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 says this, the very next chapter, talking about the good deeds of the family, then it says this, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God said, I will never leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so these issues of marriage and money are reasons to provoke. Let me tell you something before we talk about this marriage thing. Eastern Hills is a place for people to heal from divorce. I should be evidence of that. If you've gone through a divorce and you're hurting, before I say anything else, welcome home. Welcome home. Yet, 
we don't lower the standard. We have got to fight for marriages. We have got to fight for each other. We have got to get in the mess and the mire and the muck of two people trying to become one and being at each other's throats. We've got to get our hands dirty and we've got to do some provoking. And we've got to do some spurring on toward. And I'm telling you, those of us who've been divorced are probably the most passionate about this topic because we know the pain. We know the hurt. We know the devastation. And I will beg and plead, unless it's for a couple of situations, I will beg and plead for that marriage to make it. Provoke. Spur. Don't do it. Stop. Start loving each other like Jesus. Be selfless. Die to yourself. We're passionate about that. But not only in this idea of of sexual immorality and adultery and, and, and everything like pornography and all these kinds of things. These are a pit that once you fall in, it is so hard. Yes, he can redeem. Yes, he can restore. But if I see somebody I love walking toward a pit, I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. I'm going to grab their legs and say, don't do it. Stop it. It's killing you. That's love. That's love. Families, they fight for each other because they love each other. And they spur them back to the path of love. The next thing it says there is don't give up the meeting with one another. Now, again, remember the the Greek context of, of your place in society meaning everything right? And them losing that place and all of that. And and they were actually beginning, it seems to be, giving up their place in the kingdom to regain their place in society. And you can see this all throughout Hebrews and the preachers begging them and pleading with them not to do that. What would you choose? What would you choose? I mean, if it really came down to that for us and you had to make a choice you can have a place in the family of God or a place in society and let's just say sometimes you have felt more welcome in society than you even have in your past church experience what would you choose what would you choose if you had to give up one or the other Let me tell you, if church is more of a religious social club than a family, you will not choose the church. You won't. If you're here just to have a religious experience, to check your box, to do the club thing, when push comes to shove, you will not choose these people. You'll choose those people. But if we're family, if we bled together, if we've had experiences together, and by the way, you have let us into your life, which is usually the barrier, I want you to take responsibility. And we've lived life together. Hell can't put us apart. No matter how bad it gets out of there. We've been in the trenches together. When your kid was going through that, people checked on you. When you had cancer, they prayed for you. When you were going through a divorce, they didn't shun you. You never forget those people, do you? Never. And no matter what happens out there, if we're truly family, and you can hear the Hebrew preacher going, guys, you have to stick together. You have to be family above all else. You see, in the middle of this this particular word of don't forsake the assembling or or don't giving up the meeting, that word assembling or meeting, depending on your translation, actually has in the middle of it the word synagogue in the Greek. 
And, and this word synagogue was, was very important. It really hit their, their kind of their Jewish passions that these people had because the synagogue was actually created during exile. So when the Jewish people are off in Babylon and then later Persia, and, and for 70 years they don't have the temple and they don't have the places of worship and all of that, they came up with this idea of synagoguing together. And it was this idea that geographically in these different places they would have a synagogue and, and everyone knew which synagogue you belonged to. And this synagogue created consistency for the Jewish people. It created a, a place where the promises of God were reaffirmed of what he said and what he did to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and, and to synagogue together for them, especially for the, the Jews during exile and, and after, was more than just the gathering together in a meeting. It, it was that. But a synagogue meant this. I have a place. And because I have a place, I can have courage to do and follow the Torah and follow the decrees of God. And in the midst of this, this Christian preacher is using this to describe the church. And it's not only a gathering. We'll talk about the value of that in just a second. But it was like, okay, guys, this isn't just a religious meeting. You synagogue with each other. Throughout the Old Testament, one of the biggest threats for Jewish Christians to have to endure is that they would be thrown out of the Jewish synagogue because they were a Christian. Okay? You know what that meant? They lost their place in Jewish society, which it affected them on every single level. What if synagoguing for us was so powerful that if we lost it, we would almost lose everything. Because we're family. Because we have a place with each other. No matter what anyone else says, we synagogue with each other. But the larger gatherings do play a role. They did come together. They did Meet and I, and I believe our larger gatherings like this on a Sunday has many benefits, but I believe the most important is that it reveals to you a perspective that you belong to something so much bigger than you. Do me a favor. This is going to be weird. But how weird is it? For, you're all looking at me right now. Pretty weird, weirdos. Stop looking at me and start looking around the room. Go ahead. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Look at the other people. Start looking around. This is family. This is family. This, this, is, this, is, this is what you need to see week in and week out to know what. You're a part of something that's bigger than you. Look at all these lives in this room. Every single beating heart that sitting in a chair came this morning with a story. And some are having a great week. Some are having maybe the worst week of their life. But nonetheless, every, and you're a part not just of your story. Do you understand that? And as much as your story is in front of your face all the time and what you're going through, you're a part of everyone else's story as well. And there's something inside of us that won't rest until we're a part of something bigger than ourselves that could actually transform the world. Just to be honest with you, I spent several years of my life not attending a large Christian gathering like this. You know why? I was tired of church. I was tired of church politics. I was tired of, of the power plays in church. I was tired of, well, the church just being human and imperfect. And I got to a place in my mind where all that I saw about an institutional or a large gathering like this, or corporate gathering, however you want to say it, all I saw was the negative. And I didn't see the positive at all. So for many years, 
I would meet with Christians in smaller groups. But I wouldn't do this. I didn't bring my kids to something like this. I ventured out on my own. And let me tell you what I learned from that. When I was living apart from the larger gathering, it made the fallen world way too big and the kingdom of God way too small. Do you hear what I'm saying? Not seeing this, not seeing all these people coming together under the name of Jesus made me feel like the Jesus movement really wasn't making a difference. Why? Because I wasn't hearing the Carrington stories. Do you understand? I wasn't seeing the victories. I wasn't seeing the transformed lives. I wasn't seeing the difference that this Christianity thing is making in our world, not just to the individual, but to society at large. And, and boy, the voices out there seem very compelling that the culture of the fallen world was the domineering factor in my existence. And then I started coming back to gatherings. And I started to sing with people like you. And I started taking communion with people like you. And you know what I realized? The kingdom of God is alive and moving and transforming and taking over this world. I don't care what the media says. How would I know that? Unless I was around you. And I heard your stories. You need to be a part of something bigger than you so the kingdom stays big and the fallen world stays small. Acts chapter 2, to me, is, is the, the goal. I have chased this kind of community my whole life. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 on the screen, please. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers, listen, were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Next slide. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. That's the family I'm a part of. Do we live it out perfectly? No. Welcome to the human race. We're not perfect. But do you understand that's the spiritual DNA that's running through your life right now? That's what's there. Our capability to love each other, to be there for each other like never before. And there's something about not only smaller gatherings, that larger gatherings that help us remember that. And then finally, not only are, are we called to spur one another on and we're called to meet together, we're called to encourage one another. You know, this word encourage is a cool, cool word. Time to be a Bible nerd for just a second. It means, it, can be, it could be translated exhort or whatever. Can we bring that encourage slide up on the screen, please? So this, this, this Greek word for encouragement, the one, yeah, there you go, that's it. Uh, this Greek word for encouragement is parakaleo, okay? I don't know if any of you uh, have heard a, a Greek word called paraclete before. That's the, actually the first description of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives when he's about to leave, saying, I'm going to send you an advocate or a counselor, a paraclete, okay? You break this word down in two, two ways, and it says para, which means with or beside. Kaleo means this. To call, to invite, to summon. Connotation to something more, to something higher. So think about it, the Holy Spirit when Jesus said, I, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you a paraclete. And this, this part of God and expression of God is going to come. Not, it's gonna be, he's going to be in you, but he's also going to be with you. And he's going to walk with you in life to a place. And this Holy Spirit is always going to be calling you to something more. Always going to be pushing you to something higher in your thinking and in your lifestyle and in your deeds. You see, the Holy Spirit, this paraclete, you know, you know what the Holy Spirit can't stand? Stuck. 
The Holy Spirit's always coming alongside and going, come on, step up higher. Hey, the view's great up here. Come join me. In this heaven-minded thing, this is, this is what then we are called to by the Hebrew preacher. We are to parakaleo each other. You see, this isn't just the larger gathering, but who walks beside you? Who in this room right now walks beside you? That you have conversations with them throughout the week, whether it be text or phone calls or, or maybe you get together often and they know the ins and the outs and the specifics of what you're going through right now. Who's your parakaleo? And you know what a true, and it's not just someone who knows. It's not just someone who shows up and is there. You know what a parakaleo does? Hey, brother, sister, come up higher. Come up higher. Do you have friends, not friends, do you have family that challenges you to be more than you are right now? And every time you're around them, you want to be a better person, a better Christ-like follower. You want to be more transformed into the image of Jesus Christ just because you're around a parakaleo who's walking beside you to give you courage to do what? Take one more step. Just one more step. We'll worry about tomorrow and next week. All I'm asking you to do, brother and sister, is don't stop. Don't get stuck because stuck means backwards in the kingdom of God. Just take one more step. Are you more mature this week than you were last week because you have a parakaleo? And have you parakaleoed someone this week and said, hey, the view's great. Come join me in this perspective. Shannon does this for me all the time, and I do this for Shannon. Obviously, in the marriage relationship, it's one of the places that this should happen, obviously, right? You can't help but walk with each other if you're married, but it doesn't mean you kaleo each other. And you know what is the block to kaleo in the marriage relationship? You won't receive your spouse when they're calling you up higher because of your own insecurity. You know what Shannon does for me? That woman loves some people like Jesus, and it makes me look like I'm in kindergarten. <laughs> I mean, the way she loves people and, and just being around her is a challenge because of the way she loves you and the way she loves everyone out there. And I tell you, and then there is sometimes when I'm not loving like I should, and y'all know Shannon, She's vocal about that to me. Mm -mm, that's not what we do. Uh-uh, you love them. Uh-uh, that's rude. And, um, and I'm like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and if I receive her, if I receive my parakaleo, guess what I get? I get to grow in my love like Jesus. And then what do I do for her? Shannon has struggled sometimes with a proper view of God and a proper view of herself and her identity. And what I get to bring to the table is, oh, no, let me tell you about your father. That's not your father. Let me tell you about your heavenly father. And then we go to scripture and we talk about who God really is. And in the light of who God really is, we learn who she really is. And to see my wife step into her God image is one of the greatest thrills of my life. And together, we parakaleo each other. True family loves you enough not to leave you where you are. And their very presence will challenge you to more and more and more. And we didn't talk about that money issue and getting trapped in money and spurring. But Paul's context there, or the Hebrew writers, and then Paul's in another place says, you just need to learn to be content when it comes to money. When it comes to money, just be content with where you're at. Let me ask you, if you never received more money than you received right now and your, and your economic status never changed for the rest of your life, are you okay with that? Now, I'm, saying you, you, I'm not saying debt. Let's get rid of the bondage stuff. But beyond the debt situation, if you stayed right where you are, are you okay with that? The kingdom of God would tell you to be. And if God ch chooses to change that, praise God. That's up to him, not you. You be content. 
And yet, on the other side of that coin, I can show you verse after verse that talks about a holy discontent. That there's something burning in you about the things of God where you know there's more and you want it. And you continually seek after the more that's there of God. No matter, you never, status quo is not reality in the kingdom of God. You always want whatever it is that you're not experiencing. And you surround yourself with a family that pushes you toward that. And all the more, as we see the day approaching, nothing gives you more courage to grow and to mature and to not get stuck like your perspective of where you're actually headed. We need a good perspective of heaven. 50 of us from this church just spent six weeks diving into the word of God to repent and to get a proper perspective of heaven so that it would actually affect our lives today and to move us in excitement about what's ahead of us in the future so we can live the kingdom today. And I would tell you that's part of being a parakaleo. Don't forget. Can I parakaleo you right now? You ready? Here it is. Hey, Brothers and sisters, guess what? He's coming back. That should change your day. He's coming back. So, as we conclude, everyone in society is living in fear of instability. Everyone out there right now is jockeying for a position or positioning themselves for a place. They're making a way for themselves. Don't play that game. Because you already have a place. Jesus made a way for you. His very blood bought you your seat at the table for everything good in the kingdom, have a seat. Take your place and enjoy your destiny. Love the family of God during these times by not running from conflict, but godly confronting each other, meeting with each other. And with those that you're called to, walk with them and be a para kaleo. Are you tired of walking in circles? It's time to take your place. In fact, next Sunday, we're going to devote the whole time to talking about your seat at the table. How do you find your seat at the table in the family of God? And sit down and enjoy the favor you were always destined to have. If we can pray for you in any way, I'll be down front as we stand and sing.